Hello, everybody. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about random variables, slippery little devils that sometimes want to take on this value over here. Sometimes they want to be over here, sometimes over here. And in this video, we're going to try to get a handle on what's going on. So the first thing we're going to do is set up some notation. Just like in algebra, we're going to use Roman letters like X, Y, and Z, or maybe A, B, and C, or your favorite letter for a random variable. But we're going to use the convention in probability and statistics that random variables are always denoted by capital letters. So in this video, I'm going to use things like capital X, capital Y, and capital Z. And I realize that it might be confusing looking at these letters to figure out whether they're capital or not. Now, for the record, my lowercase letters are much like curlier, but I think there's not going to be a problem within the context of each problem that we're talking about. At least I hope not. So a random variable is a function. It is a mapping. It takes things from one set into another. And the set that it starts in is a sample space or set of all possible outcomes for an experiment involving probability. And so it takes an outcome. It might be rolling a die and seeing what you get on the die. It might be flipping a coin and the outcomes are heads and tails. And so this function is going to say, give me heads and I will give you a number. Give me tails and I will give you a number. And it has to give you some sort of real number. So as this example, let's be a little more specific here. Suppose I flip a fair coin and I get heads with probability one half and tails with probability one half. I'm going to define a random variable capital X to be one if I get heads on the coin and zero if I get tails on the coin. So there, that's some sort of function that takes the outcomes of the coin flipping experiment and spits out numbers. And in this case, X will take on the value zero and one with probability one half each. But let's try to make this just slightly more interesting. Uh, suppose the coin is maybe a little bit unfair. Maybe it's weighted or warped. And so suppose the probability of getting P is not exactly one half. It might be, you know, three fourths. I don't know. That's the only number I can come up with that wasn't one half. But let's just make it its own variable. So it's a parameter. I'm going to call this little P. This is a fixed number between zero and one inclusive. We can have a two headed coin or a two tailed coin where we might always get heads or never get heads. So little p is going to be a parameter for this model we're building, and it is the probability of getting heads. Now, defining x to be 1 or 0, depending on whether we get heads or tails, we can rewrite x by taking away the experiment, taking the coin out completely, and just talking about probability. In other words, my random variable capital X will take on the value 1 with probability little p and 0 with probability 1 minus p. So again, we know that the probability that x equals 1 is little p by definition. And we know the probability that x equals 0 is 1 minus p. But what about the probability that x is 2.7? Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Our, our coin is going to give us heads or tails, and then we're going to assign a random variable 1 or 0, and we're never going to see 2.7. But that's OK. We'll just say that that will happen with probability 0. So the situation is still well defined, but the probability of seeing 2.7 or really anything other than zero and one is zero. So let's write out probabilities in a function. So I'm gonna look at the probability that the random variable capital X equals some little x, where little x is gonna be a variable where I can plug in 2.7 or plug in one or plug in zero. And to describe uh, the random variable we've talked about, I want the function to give me p when I plug in 1, 1 minus p when I plug in 0, and I want the function to give me 0 for anything else I plug in. This is known as a probability mass function for this random variable. And in probability and statistics, we usually denote probability mass functions by a simple f of x. We're going to use the abbreviation PMF for probability mass function. So we've got our random variable with this probability mass function. And if you imagine a number line with 0 and 1, and maybe histograms at a height of p and 1 minus p, and as you change p, 
you're going to change sort of how the values are distributed. So this random variable is said to have a distribution and it's known as a Bernoulli distribution. This very common one zero scenario is known as a Bernoulli distribution and it involves a parameter P. So if we say that X is a Bernoulli random variable or equivalently, it has a Bernoulli distribution. And we write that like this. We take a capital X and we do this squiggly line, which can be read has the distribution. And then I'm gonna write Bernoulli of P or maybe sometimes just burn of P. So in the future, if a problem starts off with, suppose that X is Bernoulli with parameter P, that means you're working with this probability mass function. So now I wanna talk really briefly about something known as an indicator function. And I really debated a lot whether or not I would include that in this video series. I think that indicator functions are really important when you start to do higher probability and statistics, say something like mathematical statistics, which is a very specific subject, not so important right here. So I debated whether or not I should include them and uh, I'm gonna add them in here, but if you wanna skip this slide, go for it. I'm gonna let A be any set, any subset of the real numbers. And I'm gonna define a function that usually you call F, right, for a function, but I'm gonna call that function capital I for an indicator. And I'm gonna denote it by a capital I sub A, where A is this fixed set. And then it's gonna be a function of X. And so I need to plug X's in here and it will give me values. And it's gonna be defined so that I will get the value one whenever X is in that set A and I'll get the value zero whenever X is not in A. So now if I go back to the Bernoulli distribution, we can write the probability mass function out in one line a little more succinctly. I'm gonna write it and then we'll go back and trace through and make sure we can see that this is the same function. I'm gonna write it as P to the X, one minus P to the one minus X, times an indicator function that says that X has to be in this discrete set, including the two numbers, zero and one. And I know it's a discrete set as opposed to the entire continuous interval between zero and one, because I used curly brackets as opposed to parentheses or just like closed non-curly brackets. So let's check it out. If I plug X equals one into this, this indicator is gonna turn on and be one. I'm gonna get P to the one, which is P, and I'm gonna get one minus P to the one minus one, and that's one minus P to the zero, and that part goes away. So if you kept track of all those things, when you plug in X equals one, you end up with just P, which is what we wanted for the Bernoulli probability mass function. Similarly, when I plug in zero, the P to the zero part is going to disappear, and I'll get one minus P to the one, or simply one minus P. The indicator will turn on and become the number one. And so the only thing that's left when you take the P to the zero and the one and multiply by that one minus P to the one in the middle is one minus P. So that's also what we had for the probability mass function for the Bernoulli. And finally, go ahead and plug something like 2.7 in here. You get P to the 2.7, one minus P to the one minus 2.7, uh, but none of it matters because when you plug in 2.7 to this indicator, because 2.7 is not in this set containing the two elements zero and one, the indicator becomes zero and zeros the whole thing out. So this is a more compact way of what we wrote on the previous slide, which was a piecewise defined function with three parts. And that's not the greatest argument for using indicator functions because it really wasn't hard to write it out piecewise. And it's not hard to just decide we're just going to assume and zero otherwise and not keep writing that over and over again. The benefit of using indicator functions really comes in in what I was talking about kind of higher probability and statistics, especially when you have results and theorems that say if you can factor a probability mass function in a certain way, if you can separate it into two pieces in a certain way, then you have a certain result. When you have any sort of result based on factoring the probability mass function, it is a good idea, I think, to have indicators in there because that is part of what needs to be pulled apart. But again, you don't need it for this particular probability series.
Okay, let's talk about another distribution. So in this case, I have a sequence of independent trials of an experiment. And each trial has one of two possible outcomes, and I'm gonna call them either success or failure. Could be one and zero. Could be heads and tails. Could be I made the basket, I did not make the basket. Any sort of yes, no, success, failure scenario. So again, I've got independent trials. Independence is important here. And I'm gonna let P be a parameter that's going to represent the probability of getting success on any one trial. So now I'm gonna define a random variable capital X to be the number of trials up to and including the first success. This is a random variable and it may take the value um, one or two or three. In fact, to get a first success, we need at least one trial. So we do know that this random variable takes on these values. And let's try to find the probability mass function. So the probability that X equals one, that means you get success on the first trial. Right off the bat, you get success, you make that basket. And that probability is little p by definition. The probability that X equals two, that means you get your first success on the second trial. And that means you first fail to make the basket and, um, and then you succeed in the second trial. So the probability that X equals two is the probability that you fail on the first trial and you have success on the second trial. And because the trials are independent, we get to break these apart. This and is like an intersection. Remember in earlier videos, the probability that A intersect B happens can be written as the product of the two probabilities if A and B are independent. So by independence, I do get to break this up. And finally, I know these probabilities and they really don't depend on what trial we're talking about because of the simplistic model here. So the probability of getting a success is always P for every trial which means the probability of getting failure is always one minus P for every trial. And if you're thinking of my shooting baskets example, uh, and, and you're thinking this is not the greatest model, you may be right because I may be getting practice and be getting better, or my arms might be getting tired. So I'm not sure that P will stay the same from trial to trial, but then again, it is a model and, and model models in math and probability and statistics often involve some simplifying assumptions. So the probability that X equals two is the probability of failure times the probability of success. That multiplication again comes from the independence of the two trials. And those probabilities are one minus P and P. Let's do one more and hopefully we can catch on to the pattern. What is the probability that X equals three? So if X is three, this means you get failure on the first trial and failure on the second trial and success on the third trial because X is the number of trials until the first success. So X is gonna be three if you see failure, then failure, then success. So I've written this in a much more compact or should I say lazy way, FFS. And so that is again, failure on the first trial, failure on the second trial and success on the third trial. By independence of the trial, we can break this up into a failure probability and a failure probability and a success probability. And those probabilities remain the same from trial to trial. So no matter which trial I'm on, the failure probability is always one minus P and the success probability is always P. So we end up with one minus P squared times P. Now, if you can't see the pattern yet, write out another case, write out the probability that X equals four, and I'm pretty sure you'll catch on if you haven't already. In general, the probability that the first success is on the X trial, where X, this lowercase X is a variable that can take on the values one, two, three on up, if the first success is gonna be on the X trial, then that means we need X minus one failures and then finally a success. So we get one minus P, one minus P, one minus P, we get that X minus one times, and that represents the first X minus one trials with failure, failure, failure. And then finally we get a P. So the probability mass function or PMF is one minus P to the X minus one times P. And that holds for P equals one, two, three on up probability is zero otherwise. We can write this with an indicator or not. Uh, I did say I was not gonna really push the indicators in these videos. However, this distribution, so important, comes up so often that it gets a name. It's known as a geometric distribution or the random variable is known as a geometric random variable. And to fully describe these probabilities, we need to know this parameter P. 
So often people will write X, squiggly line, has the distribution, geom P, or maybe the whole word geometric. Let's go ahead though and write it with an indicator, the probability mass function for our geometric random variable, the way we've defined it, is gonna be one minus P to the X minus one times P times an indicator that needs to take on the value one if we're plugging in X equals one or two or three or any uh, positive integer. So down here, I have curly brackets saying that this is a discrete set as opposed to some continuous interval. And it has the values one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. And when you plug in an X up here, if that X is one, two, three, four, five, 11, then this indicator is gonna take the value one, otherwise it's gonna take the value zero. So go back to the previous slide if you need to and look at that piecewise defined probability mass function and make sure you can reconcile the two. This is actually saying the same thing on one line. Now, some people, I shouldn't say it that way, all people define the geometric random variable in one of two ways. We defined it so far to be the number of trials up to and including the first success. But if you start with the same setup, that is a sequence of independent trials, success or failure, the only possibilities, little p is the probability of success. If you let x be the number of failures before the first success, as opposed to the number of trials up to and including the first success, then x is also said to have a geometric distribution. It's just a little different. x will now take on possibly the value zero. Counting the number of failures before the first success, if you get success right off the bat, then x is zero, you have zero failures. And so it's not too hard to go through the same sort of reasoning we did before to figure out the probability mass function will now look like one minus P to the X, not to the X minus one times P. And that X can take on the value zero, one, two on up. And of course the probability is zero otherwise. So when people write X squiggly line geom P, they mean one of these two things. And uh, again, it's not, some people do it this way and some people do it that way. These are both geometric distributions that everyone uses. And most of the time you can figure out which one it is from the context of the problem. You know, you have some sort of word problem in front of you and you say, can this variable take on the value zero or not in this problem? Um, but because it can be confusing in these videos, I'm going to use, I'm going to add something to my squiggly line notation. So I'm going to let X, have the distribution geom p and then i'm going to have a subscript zero or one on the geom part and so if there's a zero i'm going to mean the one that starts from zero and if there's a one i'm going to mean the one that starts from one so two geometric distributions in the next video we're going to talk about more discrete distributions in this video, we had two distributions that had names, the Bernoulli distribution and the geometric, and these random variables took on discrete values, which doesn't mean uh, finite. Our geometric random variables took on an infinite number of potential values, but they were discrete. And just for the record, discrete doesn't mean integer valued. If you have a random variable that takes on the value one-tenth, two-tenths, three-tenths, four-tenths, nine-tenths, up to 10 tenths, then those are discrete values as well. And there are many more discrete distributions that are gonna need names from us that we're gonna see over and over again that we need to learn about. In the next video, we're gonna talk about the binomial and more. So I will see you there.